Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new season of What Makes You Click. My name is Daniel Mills. I'm Professor of Veterinary Behavioural Medicine at the University of Lincoln, and I'm very pleased to kick off this new season with Linda Case, otherwise known as the Science Dog. And Linda's somebody I've wanted to catch up for quite a while, uh, ever since I discovered her book, Beware the Straw Man, which I have here, and those of you that are listening won't be able to see it, but those of you watching will be able to see it. And this is a book which I recommend to every single one of our master students, and I suggest that they read it uh, before they come on the programme. And I'll explain why later on. A little bit about Linda, if you don't know her, she does have a, uh, a blog and a uh, a programme that is available, the sciencedog.com, do look it up. Um, her background is as an animal scientist with a master's in nutrition, and Linda has written a number of books about nutrition as well, so I'm sure we're going to be ending up talking about dog nutrition as well um, today. And um, as with so many of the people that I'm fortunate to get to chat with, um, she's an excellent writer, a really clear communicator, uh, and I bet she's really popular with her students as a result. Um, so, so welcome, Linda. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Daniel. Not at all. Um, as I said, I've wanted to catch up with you for a long time. Um, and as I said, I, I came up, I was surprised to see that um, Beware the Straw Man was only released in 2015. So I must have picked it up when it first came out. Um, because it seems like I've had this book for such a long time. Um, <laughs> and it is it is a brilliant little book. And I just sort of, I'll give my version of a synopsis of it. Basically, the first thing I really like about it is every chapter is about three or four pages long. So you can just pick it up and read a little bit. And each one is a little vignette dealing with an issue that if you want to understand the science of dog behavior and management and welfare, you need to know this stuff. Um, and, and so it makes sort of developing a scientific approach very accessible. You don't have to have oodles of letters after your name actually to be scientific about things. And I, I just think it is absolutely brilliant. Um, so, as I said, I do recommend it to everybody. Um, Autumn Gold Publishing. Um, I'm not sure you can get it on Amazon or wherever you want to get it from. So my first question is, what inspired you to write this book? Because as I said, it is, it's, it is different to anything else, I think, uh, that's out there that I've come across. And it's such good science, but it's not dry science. It's all really focused. So how did it come about? Yeah, um, well, actually, and thank you for the great introduction, and, and I'm so glad and so pleased that not only that you like the book, but that um, you recommend it to your students, that means the world. So th this particular book came out shortly after Dog Food Logic, and the purpose of Dog Food Logic was to help people to hone their critical thinking skills and to teach them <laughs> um, to teach them how to critically assess and evaluate dog food specifically and, and nutrition and information about nutrition and to try and separate the hype and the fads and the um, basically the information that marketers put out from the real science. And so the science dog blog kind of blossomed from that. And I found that the same issue holds true for behavior and training topics is that there are as many, there's a lot of myths about training as I'm sure you know, many myths about the dog in terms of their behavior, their normal behavior. And so um, my feeling was that, you know, there's great research, there's a great body of research being developed um, and published all the time in academic literature, but oftentimes that information doesn't get to the people who need it the most, the trainers, the pet owners, and other types of pet professionals. So this book was um, a series of essays, not only to bring that information to the folks who need it, but also again, to stress um, that idea of using your critical thinking skills, understanding how science works, which is such a basic understanding we all need to have and understanding you know, the difference between an anecdote and data and why even though personal experience is important, somewhat, um, what we really need to focus on are 
um, information that is provided to us through the scientific method. And, and again, I tried to do, hope we tried to do that in an enjoyable and entertaining way rather than a very dry, you know, data-driven way. That's the neat thing about this is it's sort of, it's like a research methods course without it being dry. It, it is, as you say, teaching the scientific method um, to people. And I, I, as I said, I, I don't think it's something that we perhaps teach enough of, the philosophy of, of how we understand what we know and the different quality of information. Um, and I, I don't know, because uh, you you are based at Illinois, and I don't know whether it was a big thing where you taught, and, but, you know, we, we do have undergraduate programs, etc. And I, but we, we teach them a lot of stuff. But do we teach, how much do we teach them, yeah, these really important principles? Um, yeah, yeah, I remember learning the scientific method when I think I was in grade school and then never revisiting it again, even in my undergraduate program. And I remember sitting with um, some other grad students one time and saying, you know, we don't even teach the history of science of, you know, how, how did we get to the place that we are and why is scientifically acquired knowledge um, better, if you want, or more reliable is probably the better way to put it, more reliable than other types of knowledge. And I just think that's a basic understanding that we all need, you know, and, and certainly should be taught after grade school. You know, I remember doing little experiments when I was in fifth grade. And then I look back and think, well, we used the scientific method when I was in graduate school, of course, but we never really talked about it. You know, we never really went through why, you know, why we need replication, why we need controls, why we need blinding. Um, and I think once your eyes are open to that, it, it kind of puts critical blinders on you that you say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take everything at face value anymore. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, um, so you said it came after the dog food logic and I have to confess, I didn't look to see what date dog food logic, because I bought dog food logic after I, <laughs> I bought this one, because <laughs> I thought oh, this, this must have been the first book. But so, so you and you've written several books on dog food dog food and I know that's something that, that's a, of interest to lots of people so perhaps we should start by talking about dog food and how you got how did you how did you get interested in it? I was, I was going to say why did you start getting concerned about what people are feeding their dogs um, <laughs> because I mean it is something that it also you know people feel absolutely passionately about and as you say there's a lot of myths out there um there's there's a lot of put no finer point there's a lot of junk out there both in terms of food but also what's said about food good and bad um, um and then you say the power of marketing but you, you 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 seem to be able to steer a very well it's a very honest path uh, and that again is the really nice thing about it again you know you take people from a very basic uh yeah an introduction to what food is all about through to some really quite sophisticated um, ideas and it, it's something I know because I teach in, on our again on our master's program I, I find the, the dog that everyone wants to know about diet and behavior and I find it such a difficult topic to teach so what I've taken to doing is actually teaching them how to do critically appraised topics and just said right you know now work in groups and take different things and then see what you can find out and basically their conclusion usually is mm, we don't know <laughs> and it's not and it's it, it, it's a really hard area to do decent research but it's but people love this idea that oh well I'll give you know um, I'll feed my dog turkey and that will boost up its serotonin and I know that's one of the things that <laughs> in the straw man it's a myth. Up on. <laughs> yeah it's one of the myths um, yeah but but I mean your master's is in nutrition so you, you must have had a long-standing interest in in diet where did that come from well it came um i, I actually grew up um in training and showing dogs i came from a, a dog family and originally wanted to go to graduate school i did my undergraduate at cornell and i wanted to originally go um, for something in dog behavior or training but this is a while back <laughs> and at that time the only opportunities and you probably know this too at that time um was vet school. And it wasn't that I didn't want to go to vet school. It's that I really wanted to do training and behavior. Um, but lucky for me, I had an undergraduate advisor 
who was a horse nutritionist and an amazing mentor and teacher. And he did some, he dabbled in dogs and cats as well. And at the time I really found that I loved of all things biochemistry and nutrition really is biochemistry. And so he kind of suggested, you know, Linda, you're kind of banging your head against the wall, trying to find a place that you can do, you know, actual research on behavior and training and, and doing the graduate program. Why don't you look at nutrition? And so I did. And at that time, it was um, a really good time to get into the field because nutrition was booming at that point and, um, you know, has really taken off since. So, so that I kind of got in the field serendipitously is that, you know, I really wanted to do training first, but uh, nutrition was second, but I'm, I'm really glad, obviously, that I, that's the route I went. So I've got to ask you a completely irrelevant, well, no, it's not an irrelevant question here. One of the things, I don't know if it's still true, but uh, I remember a while ago, one of my friends in the States telling me that at vet school, they get taught virtually nothing on new, uh, sort of small animal uh, nutrition. Certainly, it's very little. I don't know if it's the yeah. same in the UK. Um, it's, and when I actually, when I was in graduate school, um, I was in the animal sciences department, and we actually um, were responsible for teaching the nutrition courses for the vet students. And so I had a great opportunity. Again, one of my mentors in graduate school taught that course, and I got to TA it with him. Since then, I'm not sure they still do that, but I do know that often it is an elective course. It's not a required course. Wow. Um, no, it was a very much a compulsory part of my vet course. Um, it was one of the sort of, we didn't get taught really anything about small animal behavior, but we did get taught small animal nutrition and clinical nutrition. Um, and mm -hmm. I think a number of the companies actually sponsored lecture, lecturers in the vet schools to ensure yeah. it was covered. And but um, we didn't yes, have very- happens here. We didn't have very many vet schools then, but uh, we've about doubled the number of vet schools in recent years. Um, so I guess it's a, it was easier for them to cover all of those bases. So, so what was, in, particularly within nutrition, what was it that really um, set you alight with it then? What, what were the areas that you um, were, hmm. or, or was it the, yeah. was, it the, was, it the selling, was it the selling of it? You just thought, hang on, this is a lot more complicated than people are making out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think both. It, it's interesting that you brought up the behavior and nutrition aspect because I uh, continued to train and show dogs and actually had for a long time a, a small training school. So that is the number one question that I get is, um, other than what do you feed your dogs, um, is you know, what can I, how can I feed my dog to affect his or her behavior? Um, and as you know, it's an extremely complex um, topic, which I would even argue is so complex that we're never, we're never going to be able to say, here's a nutrient supplement that's going to calm your dog, or here's a nutritional supplement that is going to make your dog, you know, run faster in the agility ring. Um, but that's, of course, what people want. And um, um, so I, I, I tend to steer away from that unless I find clear research such as the, you know, the um, hypothyroid studies that we talked about and also in the book and also about um, tryptophan, you know, and, and eating turkey. If there's some clear evidence and usually I want more than one paper, um, then I will speak to it. But otherwise it's, that's a very difficult topic. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm personally, my, my personal approach and my, well, I, I guess you would use the word passion within the pet food um, industry and, the, and within nutrition is really feeding a healthful diet and finding out what's the best for our dogs. And also, if, if any if any of your listeners list, read my blog, know a, a drum that I beat often is increased transparency in the pet food industry. I, you know, just as in human foods, I don't think we get enough information about the foods that we're expected to feed to our dogs. And I, I beat that drum pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things I say to our students is, okay, you know, it, it, when we take the example of tryptophan, you know, you want to boost tryptophan and, you know, tryptophan, if you boost it, if you can boost it into the brain, then maybe it will have an effect. But there's an awful lot of barriers before you get there. And this is the information you need to know. And quite apart from issues of the animal getting older and changes in the blood brain. But first of all, yeah, you need to know how much tryptophan is in the diet. You need to know how much many how much there is of other large neutral amino acids as well, because they're going to be taken up because you could have tons of tryptophan, but if you've got loads of leucine and isoleucine, none of that tryptophan is going to get in, in, in any case. And, you know, we take them through the process and 
and they say, right, you know, here are the packets. What can you do? And the information mm. isn't there. Um, but you would hope mm. that with the sort of, yeah, with the birth of the internet and the information age, you know, that information should be available. Um, there's no reason why, it, yeah, it can't be made available so that people can do the calculations if they really want to. But um, yeah, I think I think part of it is because our, our brains are so wired um, to want to do the best for our animals and hopefully the best for ourselves as well. So, you know, everyone tilts towards hoping that, you know, this next supplement is the holy grail or this next um, advice that you get usually from a marketing person is going to help your dog beat cancer or live to be 18 years old. So I think that's one of the battles we're always fighting is that you know, we're all emotionally primed to want to find that perfect nutrient. And mm. unfortunately, it probably doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so, um, I mean, so the nutrition does feature a fair bit in the straw man as well. But, um, but as I said, you, you, you tackle uh, the issues of uh, some of the training myths as well. Uh, the turkey myth, um, I mean, better just explain that turkey is is a myth about the tryptophan, exactly for some of the reasons that we've talked about, um, that it, it's stuffed full of other amino acids that probably compete with any tryptophan that's in there. Um, and it's more the, probably, it's probably more the learned associations of when you eat turkey that of how it affects how you feel, I suspect, <laughs> than, than anything else. Um, but, um, so, I mean, in, in relation to, sort of the training side of things what what do you oh it can be the feeding as well what do you see as currently the the big issues that people get wrong but perhaps you know we can we can help with a bit of education unfortunately i think it's still um trying to use ideas of what a dominance relationship or dominant related behaviors are as tra a training method and um you know especially i think in the general pet owning population. I think trainers have, have tackled that well and have, you know, have come to understand, um, you know, what the word dominance means, how it applies and doesn't apply in dog relationships, um, and how, you know, how it doesn't directly apply to training or shouldn't directly apply to training. But I think in the general public, you know, I think you still hear, oh, what dog in your family is a dominant dog? Or is your dog dominating you because he doesn't want to get off the bed? Or, you know, so I think that still continues to be an issue that as trainers, behaviorists, academics, um, we're still battling, um, unfortunately. So why do you think that has persisted so much? Do you think it's because, you know, as humans, we are very, a lot of humans are very power focused in their thinking or? Yes, yeah, so I wonder if it's, you know, again, that we, we seek hierarchy and like you said, that we're we're very involved with power. And I think there's something sexy or attractive or appealing to some people about that whole, you know, I'm the leader, my dog's, you know, going to be my loyal follower, almost again, a mythology of a relationship, um, you know, and, and of course, you know, you can't, I think we can't even discuss this without bringing into the idea that our dogs are domesticated wolves and people have this, you know, romanticized view of wolves as well. So, um, I think it's complicated, but I think, as you said, it's it's probably um, probably you know related to our needs to have power and hierarchical relationships. Yeah, because I mean, it's something I, I think the last five years we've seen quite a big shift in the UK with that sort of attitude. I'm not I'm not hearing it as much from clients, which is good. Um, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is. But I, I generally find that in the clinic that when you start to talk to people, you know, what sort of relationship do you want with your pet? Very few of them mention anything about wanting to dominate it or or to be dominated by it. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and say, yeah. well, you know, let, let's work on building a friendship. And, you know, friendship has different roles yes. and responsibilities. And, you know, what do you want the dog to do? And let's just get some clarity there. Um, and you, you get... <laughs> Usually it's male owners. You get the odd one that sort of, yeah, well, the dog needs to know his place. You, you get sort of, I guess we get some comments in the histories, but it, it's not as, certainly not as strong, I think, as, as it used to be. Um, 
maybe it's because I don't think Caesar Milan's on TV quite as much. So maybe that's helping. I don't right. Know. Um, I do too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's definitely improved. I would agree with that. Um, and I think, you know, generally when we still hear it, um, it's more in the context, this might be trippy too, it's more in the context of when behavior problems show up rather than in just general training, um, you know, and, and usually we, you know, we head it off anyway by our, our little lecture about, you know, um, about good training methods and building relationship. As you said, I love the idea of, you know, just calling it a friendship. Um, and so I think that we can head it off that way. Um, so when we do hear about it, it tends to be more in the context of when there are different types of problems showing up. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's it's just, yeah. Um, you know, we, we emphasize the importance of, yeah, letting your dog express how it feels about things as well, because actually then you'll learn to understand it that much better. Um, whereas if you're trying to, you know, well, uh, would you expect your friends to put up with you trying to give all the rules etc <laughs> probably not so right you know um try and have that uh, greater equality um, in, in the relationship in order to be able to manage things um and giving them choice we had actually i had a case actually just a few weeks ago and it, it was quite an interesting one because the owners came to us uh ostensibly because they thought the dog was over attached to them and and the dog certainly would make a lot of noise when one of the owners left uh, and, as we saw in the clinic but it became apparent that you know uh, that there'd been a fair bit of reinforcement of the behavior but equally the dog wasn't really given any choice in in much of the matter um, so one of the things that we often do is uh, we recommend what we call a safe haven in the home. And this is a place where the dog can go and the dog is in control in that, that, that spot. So if the dog is in its safe haven, you can, you can chat to your dog and say, do you want to go for a walk? And if the dog comes off the, the safe haven, then you can put the lead on, but you don't go to it and put the lead on or um, you don't impose on the dog when it's in, in that spot. And they sort of said, oh, you know, and said, you know, just give it another place of security and hopefully that will ease the relationship. So the owners set up the um, set up safe haven. And the next week they contacted us and said, we're really worried. We've hardly seen the dog. It just seems to be in safe <laughs> haven the whole time. So, yeah, this, the dog was not over attached. And, and this is what we see. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of the, it's, again it's one of those really interesting things people talk about the dog being over attached because the dog is following them the whole time but it's not that the dog is over attached it's because in many of the cases that we see what we see is there are inconsistencies in the interaction and so all the dog is trying to do is get what you might think a, a normal dog would want so the dog is following the owner around in order to get the degree of, in order to try and predict what the owner is, is going to be doing um, and therefore can adapt its behavior in order to fit in in those situations. And if the owner's behavior is inconsistent, then the dog will follow around them around that much more because it's only by following it around, it can actually make the predictions and have an easy life. But the owner interprets that as the dog being highly attached. And then right. when you give it a safe haven, the dog says, well, this is a place where I'm in control and I've got predictable routines. And it doesn't spend time with the owner. As I said, in this particular case, it was Mark because the owners were really quite upset, sort of saying, he doesn't seem to want to be with us. And you know, <laughs> we're a few weeks further on now and, and the relationship. But it's a really nice illustration, I think, of how some of these things you know, can easily be... Uh, yeah misunderstood and if you believe that right following you around is a sign of over attachment that's the only way that you read it when as i said right you could be right. drinking a lot because you have an excess thirst or you could be drinking a lot because um actually you've just had a salty meal you know and right. they serve different right. functions but they just present right. but if you think that it's one reason and you, you just see it in that way 
I think that's and, and that you know that's why again why I think this book is so good because it teaches people the scientific method, which is about falsification and not confirmation bias, which is what you know the great human tendency for um, yeah we see something and you know we can gather all the evidence we we like in order to support that belief rather than actually think. What are the alternative explanations here? So yes, I agree. So th so this must be due for an update. Then there must be a new edition coming out, <laughs> isn't there? Well, um, the new book, Feeding Smart, is is somewhat of an update, but it, and from a nutrition standpoint, is that I tried to do the same. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have the Steve series, which is one of my favorite parts of Beware the Straw Man, that you know walks you through. Um, why this young woman, if she has a dog and she's trying to figure out if, prim if, the, if the priming works or not um, when doing some training with the dog and why, you know, one person doing that with their dog, even if she does a little trial, um, still is not sufficient um, to give you an answer of whether or not. And, then I, and I just picked, I just picked a, a process called priming, you know, that basically the dog's expecting to have some treats. Will that um, increase um, the dog's learning of a very simple class, task would that become more efficient if they've been primed for training or versus not primed. And so um, I love that because that's one of my favorite parts of that book to write. I didn't do that in Feeding Smart. Feeding Smart kind of expects that you already, <laughs> that you already read um, Beware the Straw Man. And, but it is uh, in, intended to do the same thing, focusing just on nutrition and feeding practices and the dog um, as an omnivore. Um, the same thing for that that I did for mostly behavior and training in um, Beware the Straw Man. So it, it's interesting that you mentioned that because Beware the Straw Man is, uh, is still one of my favorite books. So I'll put that, uh, put that on hold that maybe I would do that an update pretty soon. So, okay, so let, let me phrase it another way then. If there's not gonna be a new edition coming out imminently, what, what issues do you think have come up in the dog behavior and training world that perhaps you, you didn't use as examples here, but you, you think, hmm, that'd be good for, if I was to do a new edition. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got, I've got a folder on my desk <laughs> and I've been playing with this topic for a while. CBD is a big one. Um, oh, yeah, because I yeah. Think, mm, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, I personally, I, you know, there's some studies out showing whether or not it's effective is one. And, Secondly, um, are there toxicity problems? You know, is it, is it possibly dangerous to use? It's not, uh, certainly, at least in the US, it's completely unregulated. Um, I, I feel like I would be opening a bit of a can of worms with that one. So I have this folder on my desk that I'm looking at and ha haven't done it yet. Um, certainly another one is the DCM issue. Um, I think that's a good one right now because we actually have some really good science on it. And I actually think that's true about CBD yeah. as well. DCM. Um, so nutritional supplements, I think I would definitely add nutritional supplements in there in terms of affecting behavior. Um, you know, so, so in terms, cause I know you guessed about behavior rather than nutrition. Um, so CBD, the other issue um, that I think is interesting um, is, um, is what I call, and I don't want this to sound pejorative, but um, what I call the path pathology pathologization of of behavior of um, and you used a good example a second ago um, is that when a dog follows a person around many trainers will immediately say your dog's overattached she's going to be at risk of separation anxiety and I would argue that maybe your dog just likes being with you, or maybe this isn't a problem, and, you know, or I love your, you know, give the dog a safe haven so he's more choice in his life. Um, so I, I think there's been a tendency to turn every behavior that we don't particularly like, or that doesn't fit completely with our lifestyle into a pathology, rather than just a normal behavior that's just a dog being a dog. And that, um, that on our side, and this is, again, this is Going over into judgment more than in science, but but then on our side, we you know we 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 need to actually learn. You know, it, it, I can't have everything I want in a relationship with the dog. This is just the dog expressing himself. Um, so I think that's a trend that I have seen in recent years and not been particularly happy about. Certainly, um, and and think that we do need research that um, looks at. And I think this is coming about more and more with a lot of the cognitive science researchers seeing that looks at 
how the dog perceives his world, why they behave the way they do, and how we, this again, not really science, but how we can be more tolerant and accepting of that, rather than turning everything into a behavior problem that doesn't particularly fit our lifestyle. This idea that every, you know, every problem that a dog has is medicalized, I think is, uh, is not very helpful. I, d I don't want to belittle the seriousness of the problem that, that it poses to the owner, but the same happens in the human field, the medicalization of all sorts of states that are normal. And we know that any trait exists on a bell curve, so you're going to get extremes within it. That doesn't mean that the brain is broken. And, I, and OK, something like cognitive dysfunction, that's a different issue because that's an aging process. That is the degeneration of the brain. And we've got a clear pathology there. But, you know, we've yet to find biological markers of most human mental health issues because they aren't there because these are qualitative these are not these are quantitative differences not qualitative differences and even people like Paja who pioneered the um, sort of medicalization his, his book is the behavioral pathology of the, of the dog and he thinks that was that is not the best approach now and just because a behavior is extreme as I said that doesn't mean that it's malfunctional uh, it's, it may not be perfectly adaptive for the current situation, but it's following the evolutionary rules. And it pays you to take the risk of running away when it's not necessary than hanging around and being knocked off. So this idea yeah, of, of all of these uh, disorders, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be using medication in cases, uh, absolutely for some animals, you know, for the purposes of their welfare, but this idea that you're correcting some imbalance in the brain I just well I say the more that I study neuroscience the less confidence I have in that we're treating anything at, at, at that level because this again it goes back to what we were chatting about earlier this confirmation bias ah because these receptors here uh you know change therefore that's how this drug works no right <laughs> you know <laughs> those receptors are you know, not just in the brain, they're in the gut, they're, you know, they're on the heart and God knows where else. Um, and it might actually be that, uh, that the example I give to our students, you know, when they discovered that um, fluoxetine actually has epigenetic effects. And some of those epigenetic effects involve switching on GABA circuits, nothing to do with serotonin, but GABA circuits in the prefrontal cortex. Well, what does that do? Well, that makes you think a little bit more before you act. Maybe that's the reason why some of these things work, you know? And it's nothing, right. just because, and it's affecting the return as a right. coincidental. Um, right. So, yeah. And I, I, mean, I think that um, I, I talk about this, I think I talk about some B Wells drama, and I think also these, both these, this medical approach to behavior. But even some of the um, some of the techniques that I think are used for quote unquote what term separation anxiety when you know maybe it's just a dog that's just a little anxious or a dog who's just a young dog is is the whole idea of the post hoc area you know is that is that you know time passes so you know you give a dog fluoxetine or you say I'm going to start doing these you know enforced separations because my dog's overly attached to me. Um, well, that might be a dog who's maturing at the same time, or it might be that spring has come and you've started to walk the dog, or it might be, you know, it could be any number of other factors that are time related. And, you know, especially when we don't, we don't attach a time to it, we'll say, well, we'll start this medication and we'll start this uh, feeding trial is another good example. And it could take, um, you know, three months to work. Well, you know, in three months, a lot can happen, you know, so if you're still going back and saying this is confirmation bias and post hoc error, you're still going back and saying, well, it was that one drug I mm. gave, I started three months ago, and not all the other things that happened during that three months. Um, you know, we just really don't know unless you have good controlled blinded studies to, to show us that it was the drug and not mm. the multitude of other things that happened in that dog's life. So this is one of the things I find fascinating. And I, I don't know whether you've, you've picked up on this or uh, you've got any thoughts about it. If you look at all of the studies that have been done with 
the serotonergic agents on separation related problems in dogs so and, and there, there are good studies out there you know that's one of the few areas where we've got a good number of randomized placebo controlled studies um, now, uh, again, I think it's quite neat because you've got to look very carefully at the graphs that they produce because the first work that was done with clomipramine, they said an improvement in any one of the signs, which could be salivation, um, vocalization, was counted as a success. So when you look at those graphs, and this is one of the things we say to people, it's, and you see those graphs going up, that's not the amount of improvement, that is the num the proportion of dogs who showed an improvement in one or more sign. So, you know, you're not looking at, oh, there's, you know, 85% resolution after six weeks. What you're looking mm -hmm. at is 85% of dogs have improved in one sign. And that might not be the sign that's causing the, the, the complaint to the owner. So that's the, sure. uh, the first thing to appreciate. But the thing that I see, you know, in all of those studies, whether it's clomipramine or whether it's fluoxetine, uh, and these studies are generally done with, uh, you know, a behavior modification plan as well. You get to 85% and it plateaus off. And consistently in every study, what you see is that um, there are 15% of dogs that are not responding to uh, the medication combined with the behavior modification program. And, you know, we, we need to sort of work out why are they not actually responding? And to me, the reason why they're not responding is because if, if they're not responding and 85% of them are, then that other 15% must have something different, even though superficially it looks like it, uh, you know, it seems to, it, it meets the inclusion criteria. But it's just, as I said, you see it across the studies with both fluoxetine mm -hmm. and clomipramine as well. And I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if you've got any thoughts as to why 15% of the dogs, what is what are those 15% of dogs actually got that the others haven't? Right, right. No, I think that's a very good point. I, I think that's, we see it also, um, it's pretty common in studies that of dogs who supposedly have um, um, food allergies or food induced allergies is the same thing is that you know the way to diagnose it is do um, an elimination test and, and they'll say they'll say if there is a 50% reduction in signs and those signs can be any of the signs puritis or itchiness um, scaling of skin um, redness um, a 50% reduction um, shows that the dog does have a food allergy and then you'll go on and do a food trial but you know we also have some quite a bit of evidence that many dogs, and it, if not most dogs, actually have a seasonal allergy. So again, you have that time issue in there, in that how many, what I always question is, well, how many of that, those dogs, regardless of how many do show an improvement, improved because the seasons changed and other allergens have, have changed, and how many of them um, have something else, which in this case probably is some type of seasonal allergy. Um, but it's it's definitely a problem, right? Even in that case, at the diagnostic stage, you know, rather than even the treatment stage. Yeah, and for my PhD, I looked at a range of repetitive behavior problems in horses, and one of them was a condition known as head shaking. And one of the things that was became quite clear was that about five percent of horses spontaneously resolve every year, and you know. And I just sort of thought, well, given the sort of time scales, you know, if I was to say to a hundred horse owners, you know, next time there's a full moon, dance naked around your horse and get a dead frog and, uh, you know, shove it under the horse's tail, a proportion of those people are going to think that it's a miracle, you know, because <laughs> sometime in the next two or three months, their horse will stop head shaking. Yes. And yeah. And when people are desperate and they keep trying one thing after another, that spontaneous recovery, because it happens to coincide with something they make these causal links and that it's one of the again it's it's something which i have to impress upon our students that the idea of using uh, interventions for which that you know they say well it can't do any harm yet yeah, delaying effective treatment is doing harm yes if we've I got agree. if we've got agents that we know that can make a difference then actually yeah 
saying, well, this is natural and it won't do any harm. Yes, it is because you're delaying using a more effective treatment. And I think that that's, uh, yeah. I, th I think we need to push that much more in the interest of animal welfare as well. And it, it's, it, you know, it's well-meaning intention, but it doesn't always mean that people are doing what's best for um, their right. pets. Right, yeah, I, I think it, and it, on that same note, it's, um, you know, the, the issue of what's called regression to the mean is that, you know, with any mm. problem that a placebo effect, you know, such as putting a dead frog under a horse's tail, <laughs> any effect that, you know, ends up really being a placebo, um, it occurs be often because of the regression to the mean is that, you know, most of the things that we end up being reliant upon placebos, or at least, um, you are more susceptible to them, are chronic illnesses that wane and that come and go, you know, the signs come and go, and that people are very frustrated about. So, you know, the dog world is seasonal allergies, um, food related issues, certainly separation issues in terms of behavior. Um, and so when people seek a new treatment, they don't seek the treatment when the dog's doing well. So for example, you know, if the dog, um, if the person's home a lot and the dog's not showing separation issues, they're not gonna seek help with that because the dog's doing fine. Similarly, when it's the middle of winter, they don't seek help for a change for um, a, a seasonal allergy or an allergy because the dog's fine. But it's only when the dog has an episode or has a crisis that suddenly the dog, you know, has had a terrible crisis where he's torn up the house or he's, um, you know, in the case of a medical issue with allergies that they're suddenly very puritic, then we seek, the owner seeks help. Well, if it's a, if it's a um, problem that comes and goes, that peaks and valleys, then regression in the mean tells us that it's going to start coming down. And so you've just instituted this new drug, this new food, this new whatever, and it might have come down anyway. It might have started coming out anyway. But of course, then again, there's that time span issue. It's like, oh, it's been three weeks later. I'm going to attribute my dog's change to whatever I just started. And, and like you, um, the problem I have with that is that that may keep someone from actually using a treatment that has been shown scientifically with good evidence um, to be effective rather than some new, you know, new drug or new, um, new food in the case of what we, we see a lot that uh, suddenly they say, well, the food did it, whereas actually the dog would have, would have changed anyway. So one of the examples I used to use, and I, I can't do it now because people don't carry cash with them. Um, but, you know, used to get used to get a pound coin and put it in the middle of the classroom and get a bunch of students to line up and say, right, you know, take a coin out of your pocket. And your job is to toss your coin and get it as close to the pound coin as you can. And, you know, they all have a go. And I said, right, OK, you know, now, you know, Let's take the example of punishment. So, you know, you three, whose coins have ended up the other side of the room, you know, I'm going to scream at you as being completely useless. And you're going to see how punishment works. Because, and, and, and you three, who've done really well, I'm going to show you how rewards don't work. Because I'll say, you've done such a brilliant job. Now toss your coins again. And of course, those that were closest are no longer closest. And, you know, and this is the misrepresentation and those who are miles out. Yeah, their coin doesn't roll on the side and end up right across the other side of the room. So, you know, and it does bring home to the students, I think, in a, in a nice way that they can see how people who are advocating punishment. Yeah, it's only applied when the animal is in an extreme. And of course, it's going to get better. Um, course, and, yeah. and their criticism that punish that, that the rewards don't work. Well, that's because, you know, then they're not seeing them at the right time uh, and it's that misapplication and you say that's that regression to the mean but um so so with regards to going back to the um diet stuff though that um i mean what is your what's your feeling about how common dietary allergies are in dogs from from your experience I mean, what do you think are the most common allergies? Because, I mean. I think the literature tells us and, and the, study, the work we have tells us that, you know, 85 to 90 percent are either, either either atopic, so topical allergies mm. or inhalant allergies. So either atopic disease mm. or inhalant disease. And, and of course, that's from, you know, allergies, um, allergens in the environment. 
and only about 10 to 15 percent are food related. I think the reason that we place so much emphasis on food related allergies is that something we can do something about. So I think again, we tilt towards um, methods that we can say, well, you know, I can't change where my dog lives and I do want to take my dog for walks and I don't want to, you know, keep him on prednisone the rest of his life. So I'm going to hope that this is food and go down that route because that is something that I can at least try to do something about. So I haven't seen anything to suggest that it's higher than that. Um, although there is some thought some, that um, some of the ways that we process foods and particularly some of the ways that proteins are damaged during processing, that that can make proteins that normally wouldn't be allergenic to the dog and wouldn't be um, identified as a, a foreign uh, body are. And um, some evidence comes from um, elimination diets that were um, that were homemade and not highly processed versus elimination diets that were from more highly processed foods. Um, but other than that information, you know, I don't think that, um, I don't have seen any evidence that that proportion is increasing. However, if you look at how many people try elimination diets for their dogs, I would bet it's much higher than that. And again, just because that is something they can do rather than just give some type of anti-inflammatory, you know, to their dog. And anybody who's listening, uh, wondering what the squeaky noise is, I presume it's oh, one of I, no, I wasn't sure if you could hear. I presume that is my 11-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's my 11-year-old golden retriever <laughs> behind me saying, Mama, I want to play. Is um, that whose tail I can hear banging against? <laughs> against well? and that, yeah, and that's another golden. Yeah, I've got I've got them all rallying around me here. <laughs> uh, people are wondering, whatever, it's, it's not building works going on. It's the dog's tails. <laughs> Um, so that's a dog's tail and the squeaky was a dog's toy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as I said, people, it's, it's interesting that, yeah, maybe yeah, there's such a buzz about the food because, as you say, that's what we can we can do about it because, yeah, that's my experience that actually um, we, we're, we're seeing a fair number of GI type issues cropping up in the behavior clinic, but usually they're sort of air snapping dogs, those sorts of things. Um, you know, traditionally people have thought of air snapping as a neurological condition. In our experience, as I said, it's it's unusually a, a certain breeds. If it's in a, a something like a, a cavalier, maybe, but it's more often a, a GI type problem. And I, I think there's there's a um, there's a lot we still have to learn about GI discomfort. Um, and, and one of the other things, um, completely random, but I do increasingly wonder, do dogs get headaches? <laughs> you know, there's, I can't see any reason why they shouldn't, but I have no idea how you would diagnose it. Um, yeah. Um, because... Yeah, it, it, that came up, well, and, and you probably know this um, as a veterinarian, um, a friend of ours had a dog who was diagnosed with glaucoma, and I didn't know much about glaucoma at all, and... and um, our veteran, we had a, the same veterinarian, and she said that if it's similar to people, um, that because of that pressure, that the headaches are horrible. Mm. And and this dog, she was a golden, was behaving um, very. She was very lethargic. She was hiding. She was doing behaviors. She was doing things that certainly indicated pain. Mm -hmm. um, and the owner wasn't sure. Well, is it because her you know her eyesight is being affected, or is it pain? And our veterinarian did suggest it was pain, although, as mm. you said, how do you test for something yeah. like that? So it certainly at vet school, we were taught that glaucoma is a painful condition, but it's painful because of the pressure on the eyes. Nobody, I, I, nobody, I think, had the courage to suggest that dogs might actually get headaches that go with it as well. Right. But, right. I, but, I, but that's probably what we would call it if we yeah. had it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, it, I, I, you know, I just I can't see any reason why. They shouldn't, but um, no. Um, yeah, diagnosing it. From is again, people say, "Oh, my dog's got a headache." Here's the evidence um, when actually it's something else going on. Um, in any case, so what do you think are going to what do What do you see the things on the horizon that we need to be watching out for at the moment? Is there anything that you're thinking? Mm, I think this is going to be. <laughs> this is going to be the next wave of problems coming our way. <laughs> um, nutritionally, I think an area, and I, you know, 
I tend to be a little geeky about it, so I, I really look at what's being researched. But I, but I think that is um, is should be um, an important topic is the effects of processing on foods. I think that um, there was more and more work being done looking at. You know, we used to think that okay, um, and this was when I was in grad school. We when we process foods, which you know the highest processing we can do to dog foods is the extrusion process for dry foods. You know, usually if there's a a rendered meat meal in the food, you know, that's been highly processed to get there in the first place. And then the extrusion process is a second, you know, high heat, um, high pressure pr processing that is a second, you know, thermal processing. And so we used to say, well, okay, we know just as we do in humans foods that this processing damages um, the nutrients and we have a loss of nutrients and it may damage the protein a little bit. Um, so we'll just add those nutrients back. We'll add, you know, the vitamins and minerals that are, are damaged back in as a, a vitamin and mineral mix afterwards, and we should be all set. And, and for many, many years, we thought that was a good way to go. We'd measure digestibility, things were good. But now we know that some of the damage to that protein um, can result in Maillard end products, which, you know, when I was in grad school, we just learned about these are end products that tie up lysine and they may make the lysine less available to the dog, and therefore we're going to to supplement with that after the food's been processed. But now we know that the Maillard end products um, turn into something called advanced glycation end products or AGEs. And those ha may have some health implications. Um, and again, this research is just starting. It's, it's more advanced in humans than it is in dogs. Um, but there's some folks in the US here that are doing some really interesting research looking at how, how high AGE levels are in different types of processed foods. So from my viewpoint, um, I think that the explosion of new types of foods that we have you know, dehydrated, we have freeze dried, we have fresh, fresh cooked frozen and raw, um, those are all interesting areas of nutrition to look at and they give people an opportunity to, um, to feed less processed foods. But what I'd really like to know is you know, how do those differ in terms of these AGE end products? Um, and does that have health, long-term health implications for dogs? So I think, I think that is a big topic given where we're seeing the industry going and also just in terms of good basic research uh, about animal health. Yeah, so, so I have to ask you this. So what do you feed your dogs? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I, we feed a mixture of foods. Uh, one of the, the strong um, pieces of advice that I give, I don't tell people what to feed, obviously, um, but is to, once you have selected several foods that you trust, companies you trust, um, Trump companies, of course, that are transparent and provide you with the information you need, um, to not only rotate foods, but to mix several foods. So at any one given time, we have three dogs right now and a cat, um, we're feeding probably four or five different foods and mixing. And then we also do a little bit of homemade food and, and mix some homemade food in. So um, they get a, a vast variety of foods and, and all foods that I, you know, I trust and like. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's, I, 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 I'm reassured by that as well, because I, I think a student asked me a while ago and I, I sort of said, well, yeah, my attitude is that it's probably worth mixing foods and yeah, this idea of a complete diet and just feeding that, et cetera. And whilst, you know, nutrition has helped us to extend the life of cats and dogs enormously, the idea of just completely uh, only feeding that, um, I you know, it, it was built on the idea that all dogs needed were nutrients um, and not actually yeah, the, the wider health. And as I said, the, um, well, the gut health as well, those sorts of factors and how they can have a big uh, role. Right, right. Yeah. One of the points I, I often make is that um, there is no other species. And I believe this is yeah, I, uh, the, other than the dog and the cat, because I don't think we do it for horses either, that we make that claim that we say, here is a complete and balanced food. Mm. Not only should you only feed this food to your dog, but you should feed it from the point he's a young dog until he's an old dog and no other food. Um, you know, I feel like it's like the biggest and most successful piece of propaganda that's ever been, <laughs> been successful, successfully uh, sold to pet owners because it, it's, it, if you think of what that claim really is, we would never, no one would say to a human, 
here's a bottle of Ensure, you know, which we know is completely balanced for humans. Um, I want you to start giving this to your teenager and that's all he should eat until he's an elderly person. No one would think that that would be a good way to, 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 to feed ourselves either. Mm -hmm. um, yet we, we have bought into that with dogs and cats really since the 1960s. And I think there's there's been a lot of pushback against that in the last few years, but it it's only been recently that that, that idea has been questioned. Mm. Yeah, I think in the case of horse, it's called a field, the balanced diet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> grass. Yeah. That will do. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and it's interesting because it, from a behavioral standpoint too. For a time, there was the whole um, you know um, monkey chat that they were you know the creator was. Um, selling to, to zoos. And, and my understanding early on was that um, they, yeah, they feed this complete and balanced child, but then they would, you know, do fruits and vegetables from the viewpoint, not that it was nutritionally helpful, but from enrichment, mm. you know, for behavioral enrichment. Um, but I would argue that, you know, it's, it's all enrichment. It's, mm. it's also, you know, it's also nutritional enrichment and, and should be done. Um, but, you know, I, I think again, dogs and cats are the only species that we that we try and say yeah. that that's a, a helpful way to feed them. And, and even in the case of horses, you know, they need a variety of herbage in the field. It shouldn't just actually be grass, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a really neat point. Um, so, and I think that's probably a, a good point for, which, for us to finish. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, I know there's been a few you. glitches. Um, I will try and make it as seamless as possible, which means it's going to be glitchy, I'm afraid. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> there's some great stuff there. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate oh, thank you, it. Yeah. And I hope that we'll be able to meet yeah. up in person before too long once this... Um... I do too. And hey, if you... Um, I, I'm, I've been just writing about nutrition lately on the blog just because of the new book out, but I, in fact, I'm doing a, a, a paper, um, a blog uh, right now on, um, on some new research that came out that looked at the effects of negative reinforcement and punishment um, on long-term behavior. So if your group has anything coming out, I love writing about your work. So yeah. if you have a paper that um, you think I would make a good blog piece, uh, please always feel welcome to send it along. Will do. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.